Booz Allen is delivering mission-ready solutions, AI-powered, software-defined, and commercial-first. Combining deep mission experience with commercial partnerships, Booz Allen is defining a new defense industrial base, a network that crosses traditional boundaries to scale non-traditional technologies and brings our best tech to the hands of the warfighter faster, effectively delivering technology for today and tomorrow. Booz Allen, accelerating outcomes for today's warfighters. Hi, I'm Arun Serafin, the Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. We're recording the Emerging Tech Horizons podcast here at NDIA's annual Women in Defense Conference. And I'm joined now by the one of the winners of, of WID's Service to the Flag Award, Tara Murphy Doherty, who's the CEO of Govini. She won this award today, and you're also a speaker today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, Arun, it's great to see you again. Thanks for having me on your podcast. And Tara's been a friend of ETI for a long time. We did webinars together in the past, and we've got this great collaboration that's growing. I remember when Govini you started ETI. You, you, yes, you were, you were there. So, so Tara, thanks for, thanks for coming to WID. Tell us what you're doing today other than winning awards. Well, I was exceptionally honored, am exceptionally honored to receive the award. So thank you to WID for that and NDIA. And then generally, we're here to join in the discussions that are happening at the workshops and to get ideas from the amazing NDIA members and WI uh, Women in Defense members who are here. I spoke um, with uh, the person sitting next to me at lunch who is working at DARPA in bio manufacturing. And that exchange of ideas and what she's seeing it and we're connecting it to the work we're doing on contested logistics, you only have those types of conversations in moments like this. So I have a whole team from Gavini here with me and that's generally what we're up to today. Women in Defense in general is about that kind of networking and it's about building that workforce of the future to meet all of our national security needs. So what do you think is the value of these kinds of events? And, and how do you think the participants, especially the younger participants, can best make use of them? Yes, I, I think the value is exactly in that networking that you're describing, as well as the exposure to the material, the content of the conversations. I remember being early in my career at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and we hosted events and I participated as an attendee uh, at NDIA events back then as well. And the broader perspective that you gain about the discussions in national security enrich your own work on your subject matter. So today at Gavini, we think a lot about the issues that are facing defense technology. We're thinking about the industrial base and acquisition and logistics, but there are so many other parts of the discourse that are relevant. And so the conversation, the exposure to new ideas is important really at every stage of your career. You clicked on your resume a little bit, mentioning CSIS, so I want to make you go through it. It's very impressive. You've got elements of academia and government and now an industry. Tell us how you got to be the CEO of Proveen. Yeah, I think the thing I am most grateful for in terms of the experience that I've had is that I have been able to stay focused on the defense space, which is what I'm so passionate about, but see it from multiple different vantage points. So I got my undergraduate degree at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Oh, not MIT, huh? <laughs> the oh. MIT of the South, okay. of course. I had a great experience there because I was 17 years old, headed to college. My favorite subjects were calculus and French. What do you do with that? You go to the Sam Nunn School at Georgia Tech. I went from there to Georgetown where I got a master's degree in security studies, which led me into the policy realm. At the time I was focused on nuclear weapons issues, which I really liked because, and now I'm dating myself, Arun, when I was in grad school, if you were interested in the intersection of defense and technology, people weren't talking about artificial intelligence or quantum. You worked on deterrence issues. That was sort of the technical field. Probably nuclear deterrence. Exactly. And so uh, I worked at CSIS, as I mentioned, which led me into the Pentagon, spent a number of years in the office of the Secretary of Defense, and then decided to try the private sector, where I worked at Palantir for almost five years and then joined Gavini. 
there's an interesting thread in all that. There's two I want to pull on. One is, these are all very technical environments. And where you've ended up now at Govini, where you're doing leading edge data analytics work on things ranging from analysis of policies to analysis of supply chains and analysis of everything else. How do you pull and, and make use of that technical experience and the technical workforce and then apply them to kind of these broader issues. Yeah. yeah. You know, one thing I don't often say out loud, but is very true is I actually love working with engineers. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't realize that that was the case until I got to Palantir, which was an environment and a culture designed entirely for engineers. But what I was able to do there was dive in and learn so much about the technology. In this case, it was data, data integration, and software. And I just love that kind of immersive learning. Uh, I also really like the natural curiosity and uh, the sort of decomp type thinking to figure things out that engineers often lead with. I think that's largely how I've been able to put that thread together, which is if you are a first principles kind of thinker, regardless of what the new topic is, and as a CEO, I'm getting a new one that I haven't faced yet every week, if not every day, that can help you navigate in a pretty reliable way. And, and certainly I found benefit from being generally very quantitative by metrics oriented, analytical. Uh, and those are things that have been true in, in most of the environments that I've been in, if not all of them. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, I have a PhD in something from somewhere and it's not the kind of thing that you would have thought led to 20 years on Capitol Hill right. or now working right. at NDIA. But on the other hand, like you said, the skill sets of, I know how to take data. I know how to analyze data. I know how to structure an unstructured problem. You might have to help me with my writing and my communication, which, and put me in an environment where I can make use of those skills. But it sounds like you've created that kind of place at Govini, where then those technical people can then contribute to these grander missions. I think so. And can I just say that that is such a wonderful description of what I think serves people very well in the defense field. You know, Arun, your reputation on the Hill was just exceptional. I mean, you were known in our field for that type of thinking and for coming at policy challenges with an analytic mindset trying to get to the best place for U.S. national security. One of my favorite things about defense is that it's traditionally been fairly apolitical and much more content oriented. It, it's one of the best parts of our field. The other thread in your career is there's some think tank time, there's the academic time where you started, then there's executive branch time, and now there's industry. Right. And so, how has that been beneficial for you to do what we used to call flow through the system? I think it's all about understanding your audience. You know, one, maybe going back to the, the other thread about uh, working in technical environments, one of the reasons that I wanted to be CEO, uh, I started, at, as you might have heard in the award session, I started at Covini actually in, as basically hired to build out the go-to-market motion. And that's great for me because I love customers. I love solving customer problems. And I primarily have been motivated by trying to have an impact on the mission, which in industry is really just called sales. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but I wanted to be CEO because I care deeply about the product we're building and what the solution is. And I wanna be part of the technical conversation as well. And so I think that um, that ability to think about, well, whom am I speaking to and how do they hear my message or what do I need to lean into in, in order to connect with this person is so, so important in our field because in the government space and the defense and national security space, our stakeholders 
I mean, our stakeholders are multivariate. You know, it's Congress, it's the White House, it is influential um, policy thinkers and, you know, thought leaders, in addition to the people that we want to work with directly in the government. Even other companies matter. And so having spent time in so many different places, I think in a way makes me a little bit bilingual. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like we're in a better place in terms of viewing government industry as a partnership? Or is it still sort of a customer seller or even adversarial relationship? Are we moving in the right direction? I think we are moving in the right direction. This is the best time I have ever seen in my career to be working with the government in that industry uh, construct. Which is not to say that it is all solved. I was in meetings today with a part of the Pentagon that I won't name, and they were talking about, well, we, we love this software. We've done a lot of market research, but we think in order to solve the problem, we're just going to build our own system. In what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> right. Have we learned no lessons? <laughs> There's an executive order that says, please don't do that. And so it just makes you scratch your head that we're still having some of these same debates. But generally, the disposition toward industry is warmer and more welcoming than it ever has been. Right. And when you think about uh, competitor nations, which forcibly integrate government and industry, which may not be the best approach, figuring out that balance where I like government do what government's good at and industry do what industry's good at and innovate and move fast, but try not to create this adversarial relationship. I wrote every clever law I could think of, and apparently we didn't solve that. <laughs> right. But um, it's great to see that you, know, you are viewed as a leader by both sides. I see you talking with people on the government side and on the industry side to try to build those things into the future. Um, and what makes me happy as a technical person is all the credibility comes from data. <laughs> And your data. Yes. So um, what's the most exciting thing that you see right now in terms of the Pentagon's better use of data? Well, I think the Pentagon has made a ton of strides in this regard. And also, I can't believe I've said two positive things about the Pentagon <laughs> in a row. That's not my brand. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, you look at where the where the department was a decade ago, and they were sitting on a mountain of data that they could basically make no use of. I would say they have accelerated into the data warehouse phase where they've made a lot of progress on data management and uh, modernizing their approach to data pipelines and, and things like that, even got into data analytics and data visualization. The challenge now is from a private sector perspective, from a state of the art perspective, that's still five years ago in our world. And what we would like to see the Department of War do in particular as a leader across USG is really get into that next phase of combine all of that data that you have with artificial intelligence and solve actual user problems. And that's where you really get into uh, bringing in software to help and I think that we have a real chance to change the trajectory that the department is on right now with respect to military readiness by adopting those things. But the jury is out because as of right now, I would say they're standing firmly in kind of data visualization, data warehouse land. So last question. Um, everybody knows Tara now and you're, you've got this great career. Uh, Turns out there's only two people I ever go watch at the Anthem. One is you and the other is whatever pop star my daughters forced me to take them to a concert. So what's your advice for the younger folks walking around here, yeah. right? What would you say gets them on a trail that gets them to do the things that they want to do, whether it's be a CEO or be very effective in the government or do whatever you want to do? What's, what's one piece of advice you would give them? My biggest piece of advice is be authentic. There is so much that we in this field are always striving for. And it's easy to look around and think you have to emulate someone or adopt a style or a set of ideas in order to get yourself to where you wanna be. 
I think ambition is a wonderful thing and is a big part of Washington, D.C., but authentic ambition is even better because at the end of the day, the best idea should win. And if you're true to what brought you to this space in the first place, which for most people is public service and making a difference, then whosever idea is having the moment, you should be able to look in the mirror, feel very proud of what you stand for and contribute. That's great. Tara Murphy Doherty is the CEO of Govini and the Service to the Flag Award winner here at the Women in Defense Conference. Thanks for joining us, Tara. Thank you, and I hope you'll join me on stage at the Anthem in February. <laughs> I'm not cool enough for that. Thank you. <laughs>